Well, happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. Uh, let's just uh, go ahead and pray. As we said already, God, our Father who art in heaven, blessed be your name. We say happy Father's Day to our fathers. But we say happy Father's Day to the Father. And all the many blessings you have poured out upon us through your Son. And you've adopted us in. We just ask that you would just pour your Spirit out upon us, Lord. We accept your spirit tonight, today, Lord. Just continue to pour upon us. Teach us, mold us, refine us. We're here to just worship you. We say your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth just like it is in heaven. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. You are Lord, you are King, you are Savior in this place. say the name above every other name Jesus of Nazareth be glorified in this place Amen God of the scriptures, no more idols, a lesser lovers, no substitute will ever do, there's nothing more I'll ever pursue.
Till my heart grows tender Here be my treasure My greatest call No substitute No substitute Will ever do There's nothing more I'll ever pursue
sister on a mountain Waiting for you to pass by You put your hand over his face So in your presence he wouldn't die all of Israel saw the glory and it shines down through the age now you've called me to boldly see your face show me your face Show me your face And then gird up my legs That I might stand in this holy place Show me your face, Lord Your power and your I would make it to the end if I could just see your face. David knew there was something more than the ark of your presence in a manger. Messiah was born among kings and peasants, and all of Israel saw the glory, and it shines down through the age. Now you've called me to pull.
His death brought liberty, his death brought liberty, oh his death brought liberty. May I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ.
Father, for sending the Son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's alive. He's alive in me. Hallelujah. He rose in victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the King of the universe. Oh, we worship you today, Lamb of God. Thank you, triumph over the grave, Lord. Thank you for being alive in me today. Hallelujah, Lord.
setting our feet upon the rock and making our footsteps firm. I thank you, Father God, that you have transformed us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of all of our sin. Here. Let's just real quick thank God. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. There's been way too much clapping in church over the years because a certain part of a service ended or a certain part was starting or a certain person said a certain thing. The psalm says, clap unto the Lord, all you people. So let's give him up just a shout of praise, not to us, not to the worship, not to anything here, but let's just praise the Lord. We thank you, God. We applaud you, God. We applaud you, Lord. For how great you are. Oh, shout to the Lord, all you people. We applaud you, God of the universe. Woo! Hallelujah. He has set us free. Mm. Mm. Amen. Amen. It's good to be back together. Um, just even thinking about, before going into this message, we sang about Moses, the God of glory meeting him. We sang about David and him encountering God and the power of his presence and spirit in the ark. And the Bible says that the glory of God is found in the face of Jesus Christ. And so when we say, show me your face, we're also saying, Lord, show me that same glory that you showed Moses. Show me that same glory that you showed David. You are God. You have always been and you always will be. You are God and you have not changed. And... Uh, <clears throat> um, how blessed to know that in this age of technology and science that we can skip over a God who is real, a God who is powerful, a God who is glorious, and a God who is alive in us. Uh, amen. I say hallelujah to that. We are going to be talking again about the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. This is the second part of this series. And uh, we're going to discuss four real arguments that people had for do signs and wonders still exist? There's a group of people that are called cessationists. And what they say is that one of four things. A cessationist says that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God manifest in his glory has ceased and no longer exist. That's a very, very large part of the church. I want to look at and cover why they believe what they believe because I think we need to know the difference. Uh, here's one of their arguments that signs and wonders ceased with the apostles. They were the only one that were given these special gifts, and so they didn't get passed on down. Then there's another group that says, we don't need signs and wonders any longer. We don't need miracles because we have the scripture. Now, we no longer need those things. There's another group that says, signs and wonders faded out gradually as a condition of the organized church deteriorated. And then a fourth group that said signs and wonders have never ceased among true Christian believers, but have occurred from the apostolic age until now. So I first want to talk about this argument, they cease with the apostles. Well, there's a few problems with this. Number one, this theory, and I'm going to call it theory, finds no warrant in Scripture. You can't prove it biblically that they ceased. There are no scriptures stating or implying such a condition. Uh, and I say that for the following reasons. If it was just the apostles, 
then why do we have two deacons named Stephen and Philip doing signs and wonders as part of their ministry? So right off the bat, that is just the apostles. No, they had two deacons that were doing the same thing. And here's another one why I, I base scripture on this. Paul writes to the Galatian church. No apostles at the Galatian church. The church in Galatia. And he says this. Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Were there apostles in Galatia? No. There were not. So God was supplying his spirit to the Galatians and no apostles. He was working miracles and none of them were present. Uh, also, if it ceases with the apostles, this theory rejects the history of the church fathers. I'll name a few names for you may not know. These, these are old dead guys, been gone for a long time. But God worked mightily through them uh, Justine Martyr, Arrhenius, Tertullian, Origen, Gregory, Ambrose, uh, Augustine. But you also have to reject another group of people that if you are a reader, and I, I am, uh, that there have been some names in our time, when I say our times, before our times and leading up until now, names like Smith Wigglesworth, Amy, Amy Simple McPherson, William Branham, Oral Roberts, Catherine Kuhlman, A.A. A. Allen, E.W. Kenyon, Kenneth Hagen, John Wimber, to name a few. So you say, okay, well, what about Americans today? What do they think? Well, I looked up some guy named Barna, and uh, he, he wanted to know what Americans thought about signs and wonders and if people still believe that God could miraculously heal. And the question that he was asked was, Ask people in the survey is, do you have you ever prayed for someone to physically and supernaturally be healed by God, or have you received prayer to be supernaturally healed by God? Well, 66% of American adults believe God can physically heal supernaturally. That's in our day and time. 34% are skeptical about the possibility of supernatural healing. I like this one. 87% of the evangelicals believe people can be physically healed supernaturally by God. 68% of adults in America have personally prayed for someone to be healed supernaturally by God. 95% of evangelicals have prayed for someone else to be healed. Does that sound like the majority of people is gone? Uh, from believing that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the Bible and the God in Jesus who came to earth has not changed. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I did find it interesting that <clears throat> the more educated you are, the less likely you are to believe that God still moves supernaturally. Because now you take more science than you do the supernatural world that if you go to the uh, West Coast, that group of people who live in the, on the West Coast are less likely to believe in a supernatural God in general. Or if you go to the Northeast, they are less likely to believe and pray for and see God being the God who always was and always is and is to come. Uh, but if you go to the South and the Midwest, you know, these Bible thumpers, Bible believers that, uh, you know, uh, there's interesting things will try to, they'll try to, that small percentage of America that thinks they represent all the rest of us in the Midwest. <laughs> and, uh, and we all know that they don't represent us. Uh, they're trying to create a world based on a small percentage of the United States to say this is what we as Americans believe. And uh, I just have to be honest, our politicians do not represent you and I for the most part. They represent that small percentage of people and think that we're all supposed to believe like them. That's a whole nother story. 
But the second one is signs and wonders ceased because they were no longer needed as a church had been widely established in the canon of Scripture. The New Testament was in place. This theory is based on the reading of 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 8, going through verse 12. But we'll read the first two verses. It says this, Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. But we know, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. That which is done away with refers to miracles, healings, sign gifts, etc. They've been done away with. And so they are referring to the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which is the title of this message that it no longer exists because now the perfect has come. Well, what is the perfect? We're going to get to that. Only problem is there's Paul's writing this letter to Corinth. Do you know how many apostles are in Corinth <laughs> when he's writing this message? None. It's a church that's being led by other people, not apostles. They're doing something else. So, If there's no apostles at Corinth, how can we say no one gets the gifts of healing, the work of the miracles, but only Jesus and the apostles? Well, I'm going to skip out of that for a little bit and come back to it. But in 1 Timothy 4.14, this is Paul writing to Timothy, and he says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery these are not apostles these are men who are at the church that timothy is pastoring timothy is a mentor of paul's but he's not an apostle he is his son in the lord so to speak so this was written in 60 A.D., the book of 1st and 2nd Timothy were written, uh, far after what they would call the beginnings of the church to where miracles were plentiful and all this stuff didn't need to happen. But I want to jump back now to, because remember they say there are gifts of prophecy to be done away with. And when the perfect comes, so here, here's where they get into this. Here's the part that... They read 8 through 10, then they don't read 11 through 12. If they do, then they've got nothing left to say. 11 through 12 says this. Paul said, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. What were the childish things? The childish things were the gifts. What was childish? Every one of these things, prophetic utterances, sign gifts, supernatural gifts. Paul says this, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have also been fully known. These gifts were considered childish. And what the people who base their minds on this theory say but the scripture is mature you no longer need the gifts which are childish because the scripture is mature so that which is perfect is the canonized scripture let me ask you this when you got your bible and you got a completed bible 66 books of the bible did you see jesus face to face or did you see the scripture that reveals him? Now in part, I see the mirror dimly, then face to face. When are we going to see Jesus face to face? Second coming. I mean, it says, you know, we'll see him, and in a moment we'll see him, and we will be just like him when we see him face to face. So, 
The gifts were childish. That which is perfect refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that's why I want to say biblically that Jesus' church has this stance that we have. Well, there's another group of people that say signs and wonders faded out gradually as the condition of the organized church deteriorated. Did the church deteriorate? Did the gifts were not around so much for a while? The answer is yes, that's true. But then you got to hit the early 1900s. You hit Azusa Street Revival, the beginning of Pentecostalism, the invitation of the Holy Spirit to come. And on Azusa Street began a revival that shook the nations with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Pentecostal movement was growing at a rate far beyond what anyone would ever believe that the church could ever do again because God, the Holy Spirit, was back in the church. So, uh, so there's this idea. If you understand what the Reformation is, the Reformation is when Martin Luther addressed the Catholic Church and pinned his writing on the doors of the wall to say, I don't believe all this stuff that you say. I believe the Bible. That we no longer have to go to a man. We can now go to the high priest, made priest forever. And then we all have access to God. Martin Luther spent a big deal of his life making sure that people had scripture in their hands so they didn't have to believe what somebody else told them. So, do I believe in the power of Scripture? And do we believe in the power of Scripture? Yes, we base our life on it. But we also base the supernatural on it. Well, the biggest impact on the church since the Reformation was the Pentecostal revival that began in Azusa Street. So, there's an assumption in this position that the miracles did wane away, that this meant their extension, extinction. No. It just meant they weren't prevalent for a while. God got a hold of somebody, and God revealed himself to somebody, and the power of God came again, and the church has never been the same since. Jesus' church position. God has never ceased to work signs and wonders in his church. There were occasions, and in broad context today, for ministers who do not endorse these acts of God. So if you say, God, we don't want you to come and act like yourself, then God a lot of times doesn't walk past that. So the keepers of the church have said, no, God, we want a different God. We want a different Jesus. When you take the parts out of the Bible that you want to pick and choose, you have now created a God that you create says that we are to, that God is, uh, God is God. We don't get to change God. We don't get to get, have a God of our own perception. We don't get to take and cut out parts of the scripture. We take the whole Bible and we base our lives on the truth of the scripture. So, um, what happens right now is when anything outside the norm begins to occur, the institution banishes it and says, no, we don't, we don't want that here. But I contend this, and we contend this as Jesus Church, that God has always worked signs and wonders and continues to do so now and will continue to do so until Jesus returns. And that's when we will see him face to face. That's scripture, scriptural truth. So what I want to do now is just hit a few of the verses that have been tangled in so many people's minds. And one of the reasons they've been tangled is nobody addresses them anymore. We're going to begin in uh, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul says this, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. What's the most important thing? Love. Pursue love. If someone says, I want you to earnestly desire something, 
Is that telling you you don't need it or want it or it's not for now? No. Earnestly desire it. But especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands. But in his spirit he speaks mysteries. So, if you hear someone speaking in tongues, which we've already suggested through the truth of Scripture, that is not going to end until Christ returns, says that he speaks mysteries to himself. Mysteries he doesn't even understand. That, um, so, does he understand what he is praying when he's just speaking in tongues? And the answer is no. It doesn't always. But there's an exception to that. We go on to verse 3. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification. Remember that word, edification. And exhortation and consolation. <coughs> one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So, is it okay to speak in tongues? Does it edify you? It Does it lift your spirits? And the answer is, well... I guess Paul's telling the truth here. <laughs> if you speak in tongues, it does edify, your, edify you. But one who prophesies edifies the church. And that's why Paul said, I would wish that I would say five words with my mind rather than, what's it, a thousand words in the spirit so that people will be edified, not just me. Now, here's where Paul goes on to say, Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified. Now, first off, I want to talk about just the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. How many of you have ever heard that term in your lifetime? Lots of times. Lots of times. And there are people that say, you know what? Um, they see it a few times in the scripture. People were filled with the spirit or baptized with the spirit and they spoke in tongues. Now everybody should do it. Well, Paul says, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. That same word wish there is the same wish that he, in another part of scripture when he says, I wish you were all celibate. <laughs> We can't say that when Paul says, I wish you all were this. You all spoke in tongues. I wish you all were celibate. Same exact language. So he even asks later on in this teaching, do all speak in tongues? And the answer is no, they don't. But there's some good things in here that we need to grab out of there. Uh, but even more that you would prophesy. Greater is one who prophesies than he who speaks in tongues unless he interprets. So tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy. I was not raised growing up knowing anything about the gifts or the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Some of you were, some of you weren't, some of you had some history in it. I have some history in it, but that's not what I grew up in. The first time I was ever around a group of people, there, I did not hear anybody speaking in tongues. But the power of the Spirit was there, and I prayed. And when I prayed, I prayed in the Spirit. I didn't understand what I said. And I thought, okay, I don't know what this is. I don't know what it does. I don't know what good it is. So the next time I got a chance to be around someone who knew a little bit about the gifts of the Spirit, I said, what do I do with this? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to do with this. How's this going to help me? All I do, I prayed a few words in the Spirit. And he said, pray that God would give you more spiritual language. But also pray on top of that, that whatever you do pray in the Spirit, that you would be able to interpret. So, it's okay to pray for more spiritual language. And Paul says that Pray, if you do speak in tongues, pray that you may, what, interpret. I'll, I'll get the, I'm a little ahead of myself there. 
But I want to look at these words that it says, one who prophesies speaks to men for three things. Edification, exhortation, and consolation. For most of us, when we hear the word prophets and the prophetic, what do we think about? Hear ye, hear ye, thus saith the Lord. I'm going to give you a warning. Paul says, here's, what, here's what's going to happen. Edification, that's to instruct and improve your spiritual knowledge. Exhortation, it's language intended to encourage you, not discourage you. Consolation, something said that would bring you tremendous comfort. So, even when we begin to hear the word prophecy, most people think that they're a person who's supposed to go around like some of the prophets in the Old Testament and warn people of things to come. <coughs> Paul says, here's what prophecy does. Edifies, exhorts, consoles. Go to verse 12. Paul says this, So also you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Therefore, here's where I was ahead of myself, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So if you currently do not speak in tongues, it's okay. Paul may have wished everyone did, but he says do all, and they didn't. But if you do pray, pray that you would interpret. So you wouldn't just edify yourself, that you would edify the entire church, that you would edify or exhort or console. Verse 26, what is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble? Each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Now, most of our church, most of our church services aren't churches uh, when you assemble and you come together. Somebody may have a psalm. Someone may have a teaching. Someone may have a revelation or a tongue, an interpretation. The church over time developed into a systematic congregation to where a teacher taught and people listened. I have been to and have been a part of something called body life services. Body life services were services where you would prepare you would ask God to get you ready, and you would come together, and you might have a psalm. You might have a teaching. You might have a revelation. You might have an, a tongue and an interpretation. Is that biblical? Now, you've got to remember that these people were not meeting in an auditorium. I mean, there were no mega churches. They didn't have seven services in a day. They had small homes where people gathered in them just like this. And you'd say, okay, yeah, this is, you know, this is small. This is really small. Well, uh, last Sunday, just for, just for knowledge's sake, we drove around to churches. We're as big as uh, five other churches in Fredericktown right now. So does that, in a comparison, do you want to compare yourselves? No, don't compare yourselves among yourselves. But there's small groups meeting in a lot of places. Where can you have what would be called a body life service? You could have it in small groups. These guys didn't have big mega churches and big buildings to go to and where somebody led the way and they didn't know all the people. They knew everybody in the room. Because they knew everybody in the room, then they had the opportunity for people to come and bring a tea. I've been in these services. I've been in services like this. Very edifying. Sometimes a little out of order, sometimes a little chaotic, but we're going to get back to that. Paul says this in verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three and each in turn and what one must interpret. Okay, so you have this service. Somebody speaks in tongues. Somebody else speaks in tongues. Somebody else speaks in tongues. Halt. Two or three. What's God saying? We want an interpretation. We want the whole church to be edified. So that when you do that, it shouldn't be you run out the door and say, oh, now the devil's here. Two or three people spoke in tongues. 
And what if you don't get an interpretation? Does that mean it wasn't from God? Or could it be that somebody got, had the interpretation, but there wasn't a, an atmosphere of risk taking to someone to say, I believe this is what I hear the Lord saying. Have you ever been somewhere and you walked away from someone and you said, oh man, I knew I should have said that. I had this, God put this on my heart and I, I really believe I was supposed to say that and I missed that opportunity. And the answer is, I, I think we all have. I've walked away from things before and said, man alive, that was God. I should have said that and I, I didn't. I held up for some reason or another. So sometimes you can have people who do speak in tongues and nobody interprets. And it's just out of, okay, I don't want to be wrong. Uh, even me as an educator, I'll go to stuff. I went to something, they started this new stuff called a unit of instruction that we're supposed to do. And the people who were leading it was Desi and they were very new to it. And they asked a question, so I answered the question. And, uh, and my answer was correct, giving the right circumstance. And the lady said, no, you're entirely wrong. <laughs> that, you, 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 don't, you don't really understand. Um, and you know how many people then wanted to say something the rest of the day when she asked questions? <laughs> Not a soul. <laughs> so, um, but a risk-taking atmosphere means that you have the ability and the freedom to be wrong. So is it okay to judge an interpretation and say, oh, don't think that's God? Goes with the territory. Both should be done simultaneously. You ever went away from a message and go, I don't think that was God. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, I'm hoping that's not the day. But uh, <laughs> been lots of times that I've went to, and I've heard messages and I think, ooh, man, that was, I don't even know where that came from. That's, I, I can't even find it in the Bible, you know. And, uh, but anyway, then he goes on to say, but if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So God releases this gift of tongues and nobody's there to interpret it. And you, you give it time. You say, oh, does anybody have an interpretation? And it could be that somebody does and doesn't say it, but it could be that somebody doesn't. Then that person probably would just supposed to be speaking to God not to everybody else. That is what is called your prayer language. That's something you use between you and God. And a lot of people confuse that as a gift that they're supposed to bring to the church. They're supposed to give a message in tongue and somebody interpret. Now, do you know if you have people in this room who can interpret a tongue if it occurs? Well, you wouldn't know that if you don't ask a question. You wouldn't know that if somebody doesn't speak in tongues. But my guess is, is that if somebody did in this room speak in tongues, that there would be an interpretation. And I base that on a few things. And I'll come back to that next week or next time. But says, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. He's not edifying the church. So, hey, that's fine. Edify yourself. You, have, you speak mysteries in your heart to God. Paul said, I pray with my spirit and with my mind. Both. Then he says this. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. So, if you are going to prophesy, is it okay for someone to say, after two or three people prophesy, to say, no, I, I really don't sense God being in that. It is. It's very scriptural. That's where the order comes in to where you're not having someone speak amiss. So, do you come under scrutiny if you're going to prophesy? The answer is yes. The same way as if you teach the Bible, you come under scrutiny. If I were to teach or preach something that wasn't in the scripture, I would expect that I would be called out on it. I would want to be called out on it. 
I've never picked up my Bible once to teach from it and thought, I think I'll just teach what these people want to hear. I just always say, let the Bible say what it says. You don't have to make it say what you want it to say. But I hope that I always base what I tell you on the truth of Scripture. If I don't, that word is not alive. That word is not active. God doesn't watch over my word to perform it. He watches over his word to perform it. So if we're not, if we're not speaking the truth, then we're missing it. Verse 31 says this. For you can all prophesy one by one. How many can? All. There is the office of prophet. But there's also just this gifting that God just puts something in your mind, puts something in your spirit, puts something in your heart for right then, right now, to where you can say, here's what I hear the Lord saying. So, so, and there doesn't have to be feathers falling from heaven. There doesn't have to be this big revelation. The electricity doesn't have to go out. You can just simply say, you know what? Here's what I hear God saying. You ever go away from a sermon or from a service and you're talking with your spouse or a friend and say, you know, I heard this. This is what God spoke to me. Um, I have lots of times. There's been times I've been listening to a message and the preacher keeps on preaching. But God takes me right then just down another path and starts speaking to me about something they said for good or for bad, whether it's in agreement or disagreement. Uh, but I'm, we are all supposed to listen for the Holy Spirit. If you've ever been to a service where there is a prophetic word, and we had a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we had someone prophesy. I've told my kids, and when I say my kids, I include my son-in-law, that when somebody prophesies, and they're prophesying to a specific person, if the shoe fits, wear it. If that word is for you, accept it. Just because it's not specifically to you, it can be generally to anyone in the room. Um, we have an instance where um, we had a young man who prayed over you, and he asked you had back problems, but you didn't. Did he miss it? Or could it have been that somebody else in the room was having back problems and it wasn't specifically that person. Well, if I had been on my toes, I would have said, okay, wasn't Randy, but somebody else having real back, you, back issues and God wants to touch you today. But I wasn't on my game. You know? Yeah. But we got to admit for all of us, being spiritually attuned in church is not something we're all used to. Matter of fact, we spend a lot of our time in church tuning out <laughs> rather than tuning in sometimes because we don't think we have a say in it. Or, you know, uh, but God may speak something to somebody else that he's, it may be something for the entire room. And I, I, that's, when I go some places, I don't have to have somebody lay hands on me. I don't have to have them give me a word specifically and directly. I'm listening. Ooh, yeah, I think that's God. I think that's for me. And I grab onto it and let it, and, and let it work in my life and let that word become a word for me, a specific word. But you can all prophesy one by one. So how many people in this room can prophesy? Everyone. Everyone. Um, now, Jackson may still be speaking in tongues. <laughs> and Mama may be able to interpret that. But I've seen little bitty children come under the, the Spirit of God 
and speak mysteries and revelations and see into their heavenly realm. I heard of a friend of ours, they were praying for one of their children and the kid began to see heavenly visions and revelations and describe what was going on in heaven. And he prophesied for a couple of hours and then he would pray prophetically and then he would cry and he would weep and then he would laugh and with joy and the spirit came on this kid who was describing things in heaven that he's never read. Does God want to reveal himself, who he is to us or not? He does. I can tell you instances in her own family. And I'll tell this one. Karis had a dream. And in this dream, she went to heaven. And in this dream, she saw Papa Combs. And when she went to describe him, Papa Combs was no longer bent over. If you know Papa Combs, his last day, he, he couldn't stand straight. And he was a young man. And he was standing straight up. And he grabbed Karis and hugged her, right? Did she know all that in heaven, that you don't have any of that stuff, that there's no need for healing in heaven, that everyone's healthy and whole, that every tear will be wiped away, and pain and sickness and sorrow will be no more? She's never read that in the scripture. But she saw that in a revelation. She saw that in a dream. So, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. Again, edified, the church lifted up, consoled, comforted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. Now, this one is a little... I think Paul steps into the office of prophet when he says the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. But there are people who think all can prophesy, but there are people who operate in that gift on a regular basis. And so one prophet, you got three prophets together. Those prophets are subject to hear God and to say, yes, no, this is God. This isn't God. Because there's a, there's a principle in Scripture that if you hear a word from God, it said, let it be confirmed by two or three witnesses. It's been a couple of weeks ago that I talked to a young man and I told him very specifically some things. And I said, do not take this as my word. Let God confirm this through two or three others so that you know it's not from me. Instead, it's from God. Guess what God did? He confirmed that same exact word to two or three others. And I think initially my word might set him back a little bit, but I encouraged him, don't depend on Eddie, depend on God. He can speak to you through a number of means in a number of ways. And sure enough, God spoke to him through a number of means in a number of ways. And, uh, and that's the way it is sometimes. You know, when you hear something once, you say, oh, I'm not sure. You hear it three or four times, you're thinking, I, I mean, good or bad. You know, you're thinking, okay, there must be some truth to that, you know. Somebody says, <laughs> no, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> but the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. So there should be never a time that we would have to leave in a body life service where we open ourselves to the gifts and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that people would leave confused. And the only reason they would leave confused is because you don't address the elephant in the room. You just you let it go and let people try to figure it out for themselves. And that is a recipe for confusion rather than peace. So, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all, not just the Corinthian church, all the churches of the saints. Um, some people would say in all the churches are the sinners. I say they're the churches of the saints. Um, and I'm right because it's two. 
too often said in Scripture. Verse 39, Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues. This is Paul ending the chapter. Desire earnestly to prophesy. If someone speaks in tongues, don't forbid it. But let all things be done properly and in an orderly manner. You ever been to a service where things weren't orderly and you go, good grief, I have no idea what went on there. <laughs> you know, or the other side of it, I've, nothing went on there. <laughs> Here's what I want to say about, about these things. Far be it from me to say, God, you don't want to move in this generation. You don't want to express yourself in signs and wonders and bring tremendous revival now. If God brought revival before by the power of his spirit, who says he doesn't want to do that very thing right now in this generation? Would you think that our land might need revival? More so than any time that I can think of in my lifetime. Do we need revival? But let me go back to this. <clears throat> you have to have a reasonable sense of confidence and authority and spiritual understanding to begin to operate in the gifting of the Holy Spirit. The problem is, is nobody wants to address it. Nobody wants to talk about it. And why? Well, I think we want a church where everybody's just comfortable. Everybody just comes to church, goes home. They did their church thing. And we don't want to, we don't want to lose members over something they don't understand. Well, far be it from me to have a God that I can fully comprehend. Good grief, he's a God of wonder. His ways are inscrutable. He is God. He can act any time he wants, in any way he wants. But do I want to run away? Do you think that's our concern? Are we really concerned about a runaway these days because of the power of the Holy Spirit? I think that's the least of our problems in most churches right now is the power of the Holy Spirit being too much. But I will say this. Over a period of time, there have been men used mightily by God. And people are drawn to the anointing. And you know what happened? They got a big gathering. Big gatherings means what? Big offerings. And they line their pockets because of the gift of God. I think one of the reasons that God released the power that he did in that age in comparison to this is these men were willing to lay their lives down and 11 of the 12 did. They died for what they believed in. They weren't lying in their pockets. When they were gonna crucify Peter, he said, go ahead but crucify me upside down. Because if I'm not crucified in a way that's more glorious than that. That's a whole different heart than uh, let's get somebody out of the wheelchair. I've seen it. Get someone up out of the wheelchair. Hey, we believe God wants to <laughs> take an offering right now. <laughs> I've been in those services. I've seen those. And those will, those will make you go, why do we want that junk, you know? So, 
while I teach on this, to bring uh, definition, to bring clarification, to bring the possibility of the moving of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you that in the course of this week, I sat on my porch yesterday and listened to three dreams. They're all from the Lord. And with each of them, I heard them and I understood them and interpreted them immediately and knew what they meant. Why? The gift of interpretation. That's also in scripture. Daniel stuck. Joseph stuck. Different people stuck and had no place to go. And they would bring dreams to them and they would interpret the dreams. And even Joseph said, this guy is going to dream a dream. Here's the dream. <laughs> now here's the interpretation. <coughs> In our day and time, if somebody does that and exploits that and makes a big deal of it, can people be drawn to that? God's speaking. Well, I don't have to hear all that, but I'll take every bit of it that I can take to know that God's speaking, God's alive, and, I, and we're hearing him. But I can pick up my Bible and get, a, and get a word just the same. One of the things that concerns me during our day and time now is that there are uh, so many people with mental health issues that when you open the floor, there's no telling what you might get. And, uh, and that's where someone has to say, you know what? <laughs> you need to <laughs> you need to keep that at home. For, that's just for you, buddy. That's not for everyone else. You got to look out for the flock, not for just one person, to keep them happy. If you're going to speak for God, then you need to be accountable to somebody. So, anytime you ever hear me speak anything, you think I'm not sure about that. Ask me. We'll talk about it. I'll be wrong if I'm wrong. But I'd rather be right. Amen? Okay. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gifting and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Father, we just, above all of that, we want to thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift of salvation, the gift of righteousness. And as well, the gift of the Spirit of the living God. So, Lord, we just want to experience you. We want to exalt Jesus. We want Jesus revealed to us as the centerpiece of Jesus' church. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.